Hello, Dustin here to we'll talk about cryptography and we're just going to cover the basics. First, what is cryptography? Cryptography comes from the Greek word roots cryptos and graph, which roughly translates into hidden writing or perhaps hidden pictures in some translations. Cryptography is not really the same as encryption. Uh, encryption is a major part of cryptography, but the words are not interchangeable. Cryptology is the study of cryptography. Now let's move on to what cryptography is not. Uh, while the Da Vinci Code, National Treasure, James Bond, Indiana Jones, they're all good movies, they don't really portray exactly what cryptography is. Uh, generally you're not going to have a lot of spy stuff, no guns blazing, and you know, car chases, submarine fights, uh, taking over, spies, vixens. It, it's possible, as with the Enigma machine, there was some pretty exciting things going on with our capture of that but it's generally not likely. That's not to say there aren't some Hollywood-worthy plots out there. Let's take a look at this list, which is the top 10 current uncracked codes. Uh, one of my favorites is the Crypto statue in front of the CIA building. It has uh, three main sections, the last one of which has never been cracked, even by all of the cryptographers housed inside the, that CIA building. So uh, it is still possible to make something that cannot be broken. Another one, is Bill's Treasure. If you're familiar with Bedford County, Virginia, you've probably heard that it's the home of a hidden treasure. Basically, the story goes that Bill hid treasure out in the desert and he left ciphers behind which told her it was in case something happened to him. Well, uh, he's gone. The ciphers is still here, but so far it's unsolved. And while there are a few exciting stories like that, mostly cryptography is about hard work, paperwork, and computer work. There are three main parts to cryptography. There's the method of your encryption, or your method of ciphering, the original message, and then the final encrypted message. The original message is sometimes referred to as clear text. Think about as in broadcasting. It's broadcast in the clear, and cipher text once it's encrypted. The simplest ciphers are ones you played with as a child. Substitution ciphers, such as you write out a message and you give your friends a a guide that says A equals X, T equals Y, etc. And then they can use that to decipher the message. It's the same thing that's used for crypto quotes and cryptograms in newspapers. Uh, but a lot of the times you get more help from those uh, because of the spaces that are shown. That's actually a big clue. So this is why most professional uh, ciphers leave the spaces out when they encrypt a message. Shift ciphers are another simple cipher. Um, basically a decoder ring is a shift cipher. Imagine you take two strips of the alphabet and uh, lay them side by side on pieces of paper and then you line up, say, B with X. And if you wrap them around in a circle, you have a decoder ring and you have a shift cipher. That's basically what comic books, radio shows, and basically anybody that had a secret code promotion used for years. I'll give you an example of that on this website. So they are cipher. It's hi mom. How are you? And then we shift it forward 10 places, and we go 11, 12, etc. Notice the first letter goes up with each space we shift it forward because it's basically just rolling around the alphabet. It's very easy to break. There's only 26 possible combinations. For a better cipher, we look at the polyalphabetic cipher. Visionary cipher is the most famous of these. It was considered unsolvable for 300 years. It used a secret key and it was only ever broken in the early days if the encryptor made a mistake. But in 1863, Kosicki used uh, Kirchhoff's teachings to deduce a method to find the key mathematically, and now modern computers make that very easy. The reason it's called a polyalphabetic cipher is because you use this table to create a different shift or substitution for each letter in the message. For example, if we wanted to encrypt, how are you? and our keyword was Tom. We would repeat the keyword over and over and over for each letter in How Are You. We'd start out with T at the top of our keyword, and we'd scroll down on the side to the H position for our first word. So that becomes A. Then we'd shift over to the zero, and then we'd scroll down to also the O, and that we find the C. And then we'd do the same thing for the W, A, A R, E, Y, O, U, etc and we encrypt the message with a different shift for each letter. In this case, HAL becomes ACI. Modern ciphers are much more complicated. We have stream ciphers, uh, which is 
the basis of the Lorenz machine used in Germany, the Enigma machine, which was a polyalphabetic cipher that was initially cracked by the British, part of their ultra program, and actually they invented some of the first computers to do that. And uh, they did that by finding lots of human error in the encryption, but also they were able to recover parts of the machine from the Germans, and then you use a lot of brain power as well. Lastly, we have block ciphers, which are most common that we see in computers. DES, AES, WPA2, etc. are all block ciphers, and they treat the text as blocks of text, or bits, instead of uh, looking at it as one letter at a time. This is the Lorenz machine. As you can see, it's basically a very complicated geared machine. Uh, comes up with all kinds of variables for e every possibility of a letter input. This is uh, actually attached to a tapping machine, and all these gears you see down at the bottom would transcode the actual message into the encrypted message. This was broken during World War II, and we were able to decrypt most of these messages. This is the more famous machine. This is the Enigma machine. And the Enigma machine was broken even before the war by the Polish, and they gave that information to the French. But it was still so complicated that the Germans thought that it wouldn't be possible for us to decrypt all the messages. But since we were able to capture some of the inner workings of these machines, as well as some code books, we were, at the end of the war, decrypting 4,000 naval Enigma messages a day. So Winston Churchill is famous for saying if it wasn't for the Ultra program, which encompassed this Enigma cracking, we would never have been able to win the war. But how does that affect you today in the modern uh, world? And uh, that's because cryptography has moved over to something that we actually use every day. On the web you have RSA, RC4, DES, AES, SH, a TSL, which is the basis of SSL or HTTPS, uh, secure sockets, wireless, WEP, WPA, WPA2, uh, passwords, files are encrypted with MD5, SHA1, NT, NTLM, just basically everything you can think of. And if I jump over to internet here for a second, I can show you. Let's go to the Bank of America website and see how that's encrypted. As you can see, it says here it's encrypted with RC4, 128 bit encryption. And if we go to Chase Bank, it's using a triple DES encryption. We must remember that the increasing power of personal computers, increasing number of cores, is making it more and more uh, important that we use strong encryption methods. Um, basically, things that were unbreakable hundreds of years ago are now easily breakable, and things that were unbreakable five years ago are becoming easily breakable. So cryptography is a constantly changing field, and as people are coming up with new ways to encrypt, people are also coming up with newer and faster ways to use modern PCs to break those codes.